Well, I am so pleased to bring in my friend Josh Brown, the CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, an RIA with more than $2.7 billion in assets under management. You might know Josh from his blog, The Reformed Broker, or maybe you see him on CNBC. And he's also the author of the book, Backstage Wall Street. Josh, it is so great to have you on the show. Welcome. Hi, Julia. How are you? How's it going? I'm doing great. It's great to I feel like we haven't hung out in like a very long time, probably pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. It's been way too long. I'm way overdue. I need to get up there and catch up with you. Um, So I'm just really grateful to have you on the show, Josh. Uh, I was just thinking like we've known each other for a decade now. And um, you wrote this incredible blog post over the weekend. And that's kind of the impetus for me. Time out. You know how long I know you? You I think <laughs> I think I think the first time we met, I was like a business insider visiting and which was a thing that people used to do back then. And you guys were like icing each other. Do you remember that? No. I OK, I'll remind no you. You know, off ice. This was I like, remember smeared off ice being a thing that would have been 2011, but I don't remember was, doing that. There was this, there was this thing. You got to Google this later. Okay, yeah. Where people would take a bottle of smeared off ice, get down on one knee, and like hand it, like like present it to someone, and the person who it was presented to had to chug it. I do remember that phenomenon. I don't remember. Do- <laughs> okay. Did we do it That's to Joe like or literally somebody? Literally, what was going that was going on, and I the only reason, reason I remember that is because I think you were like laughing hysterically at how stupid it was. Yeah. And so and so was I. <laughs> like somebody was icing uh, Joe Weisenthal yeah. or something. I was going to say All it right. must have been Joe Weisenthal because I, like, I don't think it was me. I was, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I don't know. Somebody – anyway, the the good old days of uh, of Business Insider. The good old days so. of blogging too. That was a, a fun, sure. maybe a little bit irreverent back in those days, but it was a, a good way to start. So um, – you and I have obviously known each other a long time now. So I want folks to get to know you better. And Josh, I was hoping like we can kind of start with your origin story. Uh, I come from very humble uh, beginnings. I was a retail stockbroker from Long Island. I don't know if you could tell by the accent. And I spent basically 10 years learning a lot, but the hard way. And, you know, unintentionally becoming wise in the ways of Wall Street and incentives and how financial salespeople are motivated to do things that maybe aren't always in the best interest of investors, and then learning a lot about the psychology of retail investors and what makes people buy, what makes people sell. Um, and I, I just saw I saw and learned a lot about how the sausage gets made. And then around the financial crisis, I started writing a blog. And I was basically like venting about, you know, everything that I had seen and done. And I guess it's a little bit like, um, you know, cautionary tale stuff and a little bit, you know, market commentary and a little bit industry banter. And for whatever reason, like that melange of content became really interesting to the financial media and other financial advisors and retail investors and I just I built a little bit of an audience and I kept going and that's like 14 years ago and uh here here I am still still writing a blog, still writing a blog so maybe I haven't made that much progress um but but like in some ways I really have so I I don't know I'm like uh I, I guess I'm like an example of somebody that just kind of like did things the hard way and and fortunately a lot of stuff has worked out so uh, that's kind of that's kind of how it how it all happened. Yeah, well, I'm, I love that you're still writing the Reform Broker, and it is a must read blog for anyone who has not uh, read it. Go check it out uh, right now. It's something I've been reading for a, a decade, and you were just kind of alluding to some of the things that you learned, things that are a bit more eye opening. Um, kind of how yeah. the sausage was made on Wall Street, and being um, going from being a retail stockbroker, and now uh, you're a registered investment advisor, and you really advocate for um, individual investors. But can we kind of highlight a bit of like what were some of the learnings uh, from those earlier years um, about how things were going down? Well, I think like some of the key things that I had learned back then that are still that still come in handy uh, to me, like to this day. Um, so I'll give you like one really good example. I learned that if there is something that's like a trend or something that's hot on Wall Street, meaning like investors are into it, 
Wall Street will not stop until they have created so many of those products that eventually the investor class would uh, would drown in it. So like that came in like that insight. So I remember I remember, um, you know, early IPOs and secondaries and closed end fund IPOs and, you know, the first way the first wave that I ever saw of SPACs, which was like oh four oh five. I just remember these like cycles of, oh, this is a thing that people will buy. Let's make more. Wow, they're still buying it. Let's make even more. And, you know, it would just be this thing where you just knew exactly how it would end. You didn't know when, um, but you knew ultimately, like, eventually the crowd would be satiated by the machine. And the machine is the Wall Street investment banks um, and their incentives. So, like, that came in handy in 2021, just watching all the IPOs and the SPACs and the venture capital. Like it really kept me out of um, running away with the circus because, you know, I had seen four, five, six waves of that throughout the course of my career. And one of the things about knowing too much is in the initial stages of something, you miss out because you're like too skeptical. Like that's like the, the the hard part for me is not allowing my skepticism to tip all the way over into cynicism. And if you're like completely cynical, basically you'll never make any money and you'll miss every opportunity that presents itself. So like, where is the balance? How do you stay skeptical and not get tricked, but, but not get so negative and so pessimistic and so um, suspicious of others that you never end up succeeding at all. And that's kind of like the the, the battle that, that I fight all the time yeah, with you myself. Have, you have to have like that healthy dose of skepticism, it seems. Right. Well, how much is healthy? Yeah. So. <laughs> the balance. I don't know. Um, uh, you also mentioned you started the blog around the financial crisis. You're writing around 2008. What were some of the reactions when you were kind of starting to pull back the curtain on, uh, on the space? Back then. Well, one of, yeah. So I think like one of the things that I was doing, I was kind of like imitating the other financial bloggers who were prominent back then. So I guess like when you start, when you start out doing something, you're inspired by people and like, there's a lot of, they rub off on you. And if you're, you know, if you're reading like four or five sites every day, and then you look at what you're putting out on your own site and you're like, wow, I'm being very heavily influenced by uh, my mentors or my heroes or whatever. So I was reading um, Barry Ritholtz, Eddie Elfenbein, Naked Capitalism, Calculated Risk, um, uh, Abnormal Returns, which was mostly links, but whatever. Like these were the prominent financial blogs in 05, 06, 07, 08. So if you look at what I was doing in the early years, and please, for God's sake, don't, um, you'll see a lot of that influence um, until I really found my own voice, which probably took me a year or two. And then at a certain point, having found my own voice, um, I gained a lot of confidence and I started getting more serious in what I was doing. So not everything I was doing was for, you know, a big crowd reaction or a laugh or a parody of something. I started to like really critically think about, you know, what I was seeing and you know, why my point of view on it was different from most of the people that were writing. And when that happened, all of a sudden, you know, you start getting like, you start attracting the attention of people who like have good taste. And it's not that everything I wrote was good. Most of, you know, most of what any blogger writes is not really, doesn't really uh, age well or isn't terribly important other than in the moment. But like some of the stuff I was doing, the Wall Street Journal would then do a feature on um, or, or a CNBC producer would call me and be like, you got to come on the air and talk about this. Um, so that was kind of cool. And that was, I guess, like the way that I was discovered as like somebody who was worth listening to. Um, I didn't really go through any traditional channels. I didn't have a, a publicist or, you know, PR of any sort. I just kind of was like putting my stuff out there and some of the right people started reading it. And that really you know, changed the course of my career. Because prior to that, I I really didn't have any plan. I didn't really know how I was going to do anything, to tell you the truth. I really like that, Josh. Like, 
you know, talking about kind of finding your voice and really kind of opening up and putting yourself out there for everyone to kind of like, you know, give you feedback or, um, you know, kind of evolve. I would just be curious, um, as someone who's been doing this for so long, like how, how has it kind of shaped the way you like look at things or view the world or, you know, come up with an argument or even like the content you consume to help you even get there? How has it shaped your process? What, how has what shaped my process? Yeah, like writing over these years, like putting yourself out there. Well, you know, it's, it is the process. Like I, I don't, I don't know of any famous, uh, well, I shouldn't say any, most of the quote unquote famous investors or entrepreneurs in our industry who have built big wealth management firms or big asset management firms, most of them were really good writers and really good communicators of ideas. And that's how you do this. Like, I don't really know how you can manage money for people um, if you can't communicate with them about what it is that you believe and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then when you discover that you're wrong or you want to make some sort of a change, like, are you able to get that across to somebody who's given you their money? You can't really, from what I've seen, you can't really think that you could be successful in the business of other people's money if you can't, at a minimum, get your ideas across. Uh, and a lot of the people that have done that successfully have done that with writing. So, of course, there are exceptions. Like, there are amazing quantitative investors or hedge fund managers um, or proprietary traders who really don't need to communicate. They basically get their own money and they could do whatever they want. But think about Howard Marks. Warren Buffett, Rick Edelman, Ken Fisher, um, Cliff Asnes, like these are all like good to great investors, but they're also really great communicators. Um, Mohammed El Arian, Bill Gross. There's just like a very long list of entrepreneurs slash investors slash writers. And so I really didn't invent anything new. I just came from, you know, my own generation, a new generation at the time um, who were doing it via blog. But before blogs, there were columns in newspapers. There was the street.com. There were syndicated radio shows. Warren Buffett was writing an annual shareholder letter. Um, you know, there were people that made their name with public appearances. Howard Marks did a, a memo. He would send it out. He sent it out for a decade before anybody ever told him, hey, we're reading this. So like that's that's a, like a well-established uh, trope within our industry that if you want to get uh, noticed for your investment ideas and you want to build uh, a clientele of people who agree with them, writing is kind of how it's done. So uh, Barry was writing before I was. I was very inspired by Barry. I think we're very different in how we write, but um, we share mostly we share the same investment philosophies. So I was really aping a lot of what he was doing. And uh, again, it, you know, it, it caught on. So I kept going. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. You just listed like some of the, the greatest investors of our time. And you're right, they are prolific writers and people kind of covet their letters when they come out. And it's maybe it's not just for their what are they up to or their wisdom. It's, it's just the way they write. It's something about it, it captivates you. Um, you mentioned uh, Barry Ritholtz, uh, your business partner, and um, connecting through writing. Can you tell a bit more about the backstory there, Josh? Yeah, so I I was in the midst of the financial crisis doing a blog and really like had nothing. I, I wasn't sure where I wanted to take my career, but I knew I wanted to be out of uh, brokerage. Like I wanted to get onto the advice side and not get paid for what products I could sell people, but like actually help clients and get people to be like, this is good advice you're giving me and like want to be my client f from an advisory standpoint. So I didn't really, I didn't like know where to begin. Nobody was recruiting me. Nobody, <laughs> nobody ever heard of me. Like I, I couldn't get into one of the larger firms. I didn't have the pedigree. So I just had no clue like how to make that jump. But through my writing, I got to meet a lot of influential uh, investors, advisors, writers, and eventually I got myself invited to uh, Howard Lindzen event in 2010, and I met Barry there. And Barry and I had the opposite problem. Like Barry had a million people who wanted him to invest for them, but he doesn't do that. Barry's not a financial advisor. 
he was always like a chief strategist. Um, so he's like, yeah, I have all these people that want to be my client, but I don't have clients. I don't do this. And my problem was the opposite. I was ready to do this, but nobody wanted to give me any money or talk to me. So we teamed up and, uh, it, it was lightning in a bottle. It worked immediately. And, uh, you know, we, we started, we started off talking primarily to fans of Barry's blog and his book and his public appearances. And uh, as we grew, we added more people to the team and eventually started our own firm. And uh, we celebrated the ninth anniversary of the firm's founding in September, a couple weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, I remember when you guys were launching. I remember like the news coverage around it. And that's that's amazing, Josh. Gosh, it's amazing <laughs> like how fast time flies. Yeah. Um, I imagine too, like the blogging, um, you, Barry, uh, Michael Batnick, who works at your firm, um, you guys are also big on social media and podcasting as well. Um, you all have many uh, podcasts. Like how important has- We, we literally the, never shut up. I, I love it though. How important <laughs> has the content creation side of things been for growing the business? Well, that's it. That's the whole thing. Like we don't, we don't, get, we don't get clients from anywhere else. We only want to talk to our fans. So it's a very, there's, there's no one else in the industry with our business model, um, at least that I know of, definitely not at our scale. And it's the only way we've ever done it. It's the only way we want to do it. So a lot of the midsize and larger firms in our industry, they're like acquisition machines. So they sell a big chunk of themselves to a private equity firm. They take the capital and then they look around and they start, you know, buying other firms and there's nothing wrong with that. We just have no interest in doing that because we don't want advisors who are not aligned with our investment philosophy and our work ethic and, you know, our values. And we definitely don't want their clients. We want our clients and our clients are very specific. They're people who are reading us, are watching us. They agree with, you know, they're rational. They have like normal expectations about what, what to, why they're investing and how it works. They understand the trade-offs between risk and reward and why risk is necessary to earn reward. They have reasonable expectations for, you know, how they're going to retire and when and, you know, what we're going to do with their money between now and then. Uh, and they really need help. They need our help with taxes, insurance, um, estate planning, uh, next generation stuff. Uh, helping to educate their other family members about, you know, having a lot of wealth and the responsibility that comes along with that, charitable and philanthropic endeavors. These are all things that we touch within our practice. I think like most um, people that have never worked with a financial advisor, they think it's like, what stocks are we buying? Or like, what ETF do I, you know, do I like for international small cap? That's not what it's not what wealth management is. That's asset management. And um, wealth management is, is so much more. And it's really the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So we don't want to do that kind of work for people that don't have like a baseline of understanding of who we are. So everything starts with the content. And then once people become fans of what we're saying and our messaging and our philosophy, you know, at a certain point, they just basically say to themselves, well, I should hire these guys to manage my money. We're, we're in alignment on so many things. And we have built, uh, I think we have 5,000 accounts now. And we built the whole thing that way. We never acquired anybody. Um, no, you know, no M&A, no private equity, no outside capital. We were never doing referrals from the big brokerage, online brokerages like Schwab and TD. Like a lot of the biggest firms in the industry they basically rented clients from, you know, Schwab. And again, it's, it's, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it. It's just not what we want to do. So we got to where we are by very specifically saying we're going to build a huge fan base and we are going to attract people that we really want to help and work with. And it's probably the only way you'll ever see us do it. Um, I, don't, I don't see any reason why I would ever want to do it differently. Yeah, you do, you do it. You have to do it um, your way. And, um, you know, count me as one of your fans, Josh. Um, and the reason um, I, I brought you on the show is I, I read a blog post of yours that went um, totally viral over the weekend. And um, I want to give us enough time to unpack it. Um, 
but it was titled you weren't supposed to see that and i don't know it's probably like a 15 yeah. 20 minute read I, I depending on the pace and a lot of really um interesting conclusions um and i would just kind of like want to pass it back to you to frame it up for folks and then i'll start to you know tease it apart with you well i used to write a blog post every day and sometimes two a day and I, I've slowed down a lot in the pace of how frequently I'm posting because mostly because I'm busier than I've ever been. The firm has grown. My, my kids are teenagers. Um, I have a lot of interests that are, you know, not financial uh, in my life. Uh, so like, I, I just, I don't write as often, but when I, when I do write something, oftentimes it's like this accumulation of a lot of things that I've been pondering and thinking about and reading and researching, and then it'll kind of all come out at once. So that's why uh, I ended up with a 3,400 word uh, blog post on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so a lot of that stuff was just like ready to burst burst out of me. And uh, the general premise of the post is like, we really ran this incredible experiment in the last three years and we're now living through the cleanup of that experiment. But basically, for the first time, probably in American history, but certainly in our lifetimes, for the first time, there was a moment where uh, every single person in America was like able to pay their bills and have the freedom to do what they wanted and not having their financial situation get in the way. And it was a confluence of events that got us there. It's the, obviously the pandemic and then remote work and the technology that enabled that. And then, of course, all of the rescue uh, money and the stimulus and the various government programs and those three. Th so you, you had people that didn't have to be anywhere. You had people that many, many people who were being paid just for waking up in the morning, almost like a UBI um, situation. And then you had technology that gave people that that final uh, leg of the stool that gave people that e even more flexibility that if they did have to be do a job, they could do it from anywhere. And that experiment resulted in just a lot of things worth observing. And of course, like the stuff that we want to observe from 2020 was just like, holy shit, we are a really resilient economy and a re really resilient population of people like a million people died and we carried on and we somehow ran the entire economy from our houses i mean it's re it's really remarkable um so that's the 2020 observation and then in 2021 you start to see the dark side um you have people quiet quitting you have people taking government stimulus money that was meant to feed them and you know gorge themselves on luxury goods and louis vuitton and and all the stuff or trade baseball cards on the internet and like a lot of people squandering money that should have helped them buy permanent freedom um, but you can't fault people because a lot of them never had money before in their whole lives especially young people um and then you know it got even darker in 2022 the excesses from that became so pronounced everywhere from real estate to the stock market uh, and, and everything in between that we ended up with the worst inflation in 40 something years. And like, we're, we're kind of like still in the process of cleaning that up. But the takeaway, the, the thing that really surprised me that I thought, and it sounds like a lot of people agree is like, this experiment reveals a really dark truth about the American dream which is that we can't all experience it concurrently. So the American dream doesn't work when 100% of the population has the financial freedom to do whatever they want. Like we need people that are still striving and unfortunately still struggling. Otherwise, we end up with an explosion in inflation and companies that can't afford to find workers at the prices they want to pay and we run out of real estate and rents go too high and we run out of cars and we run out of microchips so like we we kind of ran this experiment of like what if everybody was just financially good and we just took care of everyone and they could do whatever they want well the result was pretty disastrous 
And now we have to deal with that. The Fed has to deal with that, you know, et cetera. So that was like the, the revelation. And I don't intentionally write to provoke, you know, strong feelings in people or try to like cause a controversy or say like dark, depressing things. But like it was kind of hard to avoid that conclusion. Yeah. Um, to quote from the the piece, and, and you, you summed it up really nicely there. Um, you said widespread prosperity, it turns out, is incompatible with the American dream. The only way our economy works is when there are winners and losers. If everyone's a winner, the whole thing fails. So going back um, to this experiment, you kind of alluded that at first it worked and then it didn't. Do you think it yeah. was an illusion or do you think there was potential for it to be more sustained? Well, it could it could have been more sustained if not for the fact that this period coincided with like a huge clampdown on immigration, legal immigration. I think like one of the most deflationary forces um, in America is just the fact that, you know, every generation has more people coming here from different parts of the world, starting from scratch, willing to do a lot of jobs that people that are second, third, fourth, fifth generation Americans just don't want to do. And this goes back hundreds of years. Like this goes back to literally uh, New York and Boston in, in the, uh, the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s. This goes back to building the, the railroads in the 1800s. Like there's nothing new about this concept. Um, but I do think that, you know, absent having legal immigration, you end up with a squeeze. And, you know, like, don't take my word for it. Listen to conference calls. Listen to what the CEOs of hotel chains are talking about. They need, they rely on every year a new wave of people willing to come and, and do these jobs. So, like, when everyone has this shortage at once because there is so much money in the system that nobody really has to work, that's when the American dream turns into a nightmare and things break down and things don't don't end up functioning. So like that's you know, people are like, well, what's the solution? I don't know. I, I'm really good at pointing out problems, not solutions. But like one thing that seems obvious to me, and uh, I think Bill Maher did this on his show on HBO. He was talking about how Ron DeSantis, like out of spite, put 30 Venezuelan migrant workers on a plane and sent them to New England. Like, ha, ha, ha. We'll see if you liberals like that. So Bill Maher was saying, like, in a normal functioning America, what would really happen is the, the governor of Massachusetts would call the governor of Florida and say, hey, we have a huge shortage of workers and we could really use some. And then the governor of Florida would say, well, it turns out we have too many people who have come here and we don't necessarily have jobs for them to do here. So we'll send them up to you. Like, that's like... That's like not a terrible model for what America should be and historically has been. People come into the country and they go to where the work is and it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows in terms of being controversial. But like that's just what I did. So I didn't really get into immigration in my post. I really didn't want to get political. And that's like a huge third rail. But it's like one solution that occurs to me is, well, maybe let's not stop able-bodied, capable people who want to come here and start a life for themselves. Let's not stop them all from coming um, at the exact moment where we have 11 million open jobs to fill. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that I want to just uh, continue to, to draw out with you. And it, it kind of makes me wonder, like, what are your views um, on the American dream? You mentioned American nightmare right now. Do you, is the American dream over? Like, what, what's your assessment of it? Is it over? So I don't, yeah, I, well, I don't want people to think that I think that it's the American dream is not attainable. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, and I don't know how to say this, but what I'm saying is we just can't all experience it at once. Like there have to be people who get there and then there have to be people behind them who want to get there and are on their way. And, you know, of course, as we all know, like not everybody does get there. And that sucks because, uh, you know, like I'm not, I, I don't, I'm an abundance minded person. I'm not a scarcity minded person. My mind doesn't work that way. Like, look, look at how I've built my career. I spent seven years doing a morning blog post linking to other writers. 
like like other financial advisors who were writing. I would be like, if you like my shit, read their shit. It's even better than my shit. Like I I did a I did a festival this year called uh, Future Proof. It's a festival for other people working in finance, many of whom you would think ostensibly are like competitors of ours. They're of course not. And I don't think that way. So I've always been somebody that's tried to lift people up around me, not beat them up or or win or compete with them. It's just not in my nature. So I don't have this scarcity mindset where it's like, it's a zero sum game and some people have to win and some people lose, uh, have to lose. I, I don't like that mentality and I don't practice that anywhere in anything that I do. But that's maybe why I, I felt so affected by this revelation that I had that, you know, shit, when everyone is, is liquid and their bills are paid, things kind of don't work. Uh, or at least we weren't ready for that as a, as a society, as an economy. Uh, it, it, really, it really caused huge problems that none of us really um, had been thinking we would see. Um, I, I, listen, I never would have thought a year and a half after the pandemic that there'd be a shortage of like planes, like they would have to cancel thousands of flights because they couldn't find people to man the flights. Like, why, why would you assume that that would happen? It's hard to imagine you, right. You'd say, Oh, I thought the airline industry, the hotel industry, they were dying for people. Now we're hearing they have no capacity. Like th these are like all new things for our economy that we hadn't really ever experienced before. And a lot of it, you have to retrace and point, point at um, the stimulus plans that uh, put household balance sheets in the best position they've ever been. Like household net worth hit $150 trillion. Think about that number. That's a record number that we hit at the end of 2021. Now, a lot of that is stock market wealth and real estate wealth, which has since been clawed back <laughs> by higher interest rates. But like you think about the amount of cash people had in their bank accounts, you think of the, the, the strength of the average household's balance sheet, you think of the wealth that, that, that came from the housing market, the stock market, like for a moment in time, everybody had maximum financial flexibility and freedom all at once. And it turned out not to have been so great. Yeah. As you point out, like for a moment, uh, in, in time. And also you, you wrote in the piece, like you weren't supposed to see it. You weren't supposed to see that. Now the genie is out of the bottle for one brief shining moment. Everyone had enough money to pay their bills and the financial freedom to choose their own way of life. So I guess my follow on, um, if we could maybe extrapolate on this is what do you think it means for the social fabric in the U S well, so I'm not a good example of this, but like picture, picture like somebody who's like 29 or 30. And like two years ago, they like thought the world was their oyster, right? They were like, well, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to become one of the millions of people to start my own business right now. And that happened. We had millions of people start their own thing. You know, I'm going to get an LLC and I'm going to get a business bank account and blue from American Express. And I'm going to set myself up with Amazon Web Services to build out my um, my homepage and I'm going to set myself up with square so I can accept payments on my cell phone and like, look at me, do my shit. I'm like a new founder and I love it. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that that's the bad part, but like now, so now you're that, you're that guy or girl. Right. And it's like a year and a half later and the fed now is like going out of its way to stomp on you. Like, um, crushing the availability of credit in the economy and trying to, I mean, trying to, trying to deliberately dampen consumer demand for everything under the sun. Um, maybe knocking down your retirement account, your financial assets, knocking down the value of your home. Like, the, and, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be doing this, but like that's deliberately what's happening. So if you're 28, 29 years old, you spent your first five years out of college working for some other company, then you decided to go off on your own. You finally felt good. You had the assets. You had the the good balance sheet. You were ready to take on debt. You were financially secure. And now it's like, wait, what are they doing? They're, are you saying they're crashing the economy now? Like that's what 
That's what the government is is doing. What the fuck is this? So if I were, so I'm 45. I don't, it's different for me. But if I were in that cohort, I'd be like, I don't understand. I was finally like at a place where I felt like I, I had options and freedom and I was going to do this thing. Why is the Fed destroying my net worth and wrecking my custom, my potential customers' willingness to spend money? What the hell is this? So even if you intellectually understand that it's you know connected to the fight against inflation, you still – like that would really piss me off. So I don't really have like a, an end to this rant. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I could understand if we get a wave of like young millennials slash older Gen Y people who just look at this whole thing and say, this is fucked. Yeah. Um, who's you mentioned like, where does the blame lie? Uh, I mean, uh, nowhere, everywhere, everywhere and nowhere. Where, where to begin? Probably a government lab in China where they were playing with things that they shouldn't have. I don't know. We could start there. Um, we could start before that with uh, Jerome Powell and, uh, and a Fed that really loves to twiddle the knobs and uh, go up and down and up and down with rates um, and doesn't really seem to have a great handle on the idea of stable prices. Uh, we could go there. We could talk about um, some policy mistakes well well intentioned mistakes during the the height of the pandemic getting money out as quickly as possible to as many people as possible uh again very well intentioned i'm not saying i would have done it better or differently um but obviously some of that has been an issue for inflation we could talk about allowing home prices to run up 44 percent in two years and continuing to buy mortgage bonds for some bizarre reason during that entire run-up um we could talk about a record-breaking stock market and a Fed that was still buying treasury bonds like this. There are a lot of places to to look and find blame, um, but I don't. I think it's beside the point. Like I, this is not about like look what you did. This is just about wow. We really were not set up for mass prosperity. It turns out that's not great for the functioning of our economy. I don't think anyone planned it that way. Um, so it's it's hard to say that anyone's at fault. Yeah. Do you think it's is is it a surprise that we're not set up for mass prosperity, or were we, were we sold something that we thought was possible? Or I mean, it, it does seem kind of like inherent that there would naturally be winners and losers. Um, like well, in the so all right, system. so that's a good question. I don't think I don't think mass prosperity was the goal, and I don't think we should consider government handouts to to be real mass prosperity. It's not; those are not the, the same thing. Like government handouts are coming from other people. It's not like, yeah, they're creating dollars on a computer, of course, but like there's a cost to that. It's not free. So it, that's not actual mass prosperity. It just felt like mass prosperity, right? So that's like a, a really important distinction. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, it, it felt like it. Um, I would just be curious, like, cause I had not really thought about this until I read your piece, and I'm sure you've gotten – a lot of reaction like what are you kind of hearing from folks what are you hearing from like maybe maybe more of the client side or even like your peer set um folks in finance even what are you hearing um in reaction to this post i think what a lot of people said was that they thought it was they, they thought it was something a lot all right a lot of people were like i couldn't put my finger on a lot of the things that you said or think of a, a good way to say them so I think like a lot of people were kind of thinking about different elements of what I said, and maybe I unified it all and put it into words that other people were struggling with. But it is, you know, there has not, there have not really been a lot of people who were like, I disagree with this. There were just a lot of people who were like, this made, this really made me think, or I kind of have already been thinking a lot of this stuff, but I just couldn't put my finger on what it was or how to say it. Yeah. Which I think, listen, I've probably done that two or three times in my time writing. So it's really hard to do. But when you can identify the zeitgeist or the secret undercurrent that like a lot of people are thinking about, but nobody's really said out loud yet, um, and you can nail that, like that's when you know you've done something 
like worthy of of like being happy about or proud of. So I I definitely don't want to give people listening to this the impression that I think I'm like this amazing writer or um, that I'm like I have the pulse of the <laughs> the American public. It's not it's not like that. But once or twice I've been able to do that before. And, you know, I, I feel like this is like an example of something where I, I kind of captured something that a lot of other people were thinking and I and I did it effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned like the zeitgeist and like that undercurrent and kind of saying what no one has said out loud. And I can I can tell like you put a lot of work into the piece. Um, talk to me about like the process, like you've been thinking about this for a long time, mulling it over for a long time. Was there a moment where you kind of had this aha, like I the idea or something struck you that, um, yeah. This was I, so I, I don't really tweet anymore. I do like one tweet a month, but I put out a tweet, um, during, right after the feds last, uh, meeting FOMC meeting where they set rates. And it was something like something smart ass, you know, like something that I would typically do. So it was like, uh, what did I say? Oh, I, I was like, uh, Fed says it is necessary to cause this recession in order to prevent the next recession. Like, you, know, you know, like something typical Josh Brown snarky bullshit. But there was something to that idea. And I think that was kind of like where I just said, you know what? Yeah, like monetary policy is now deliberately trying to clean up this thing where everybody had too much money. And how funny of a concept is that for everyone to have too much money all at once? And that's that's what kind of sent me, you know, down the the path to wanting to really write it. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Twitter. Um, you have more than a million followers on Twitter, and you, you maybe tweet like once a month. Um, it's not true. Nobody's follower count is like active followers. Like you know that, and there's no engagement on Twitter unless you say something really mean about someone else. Um, there's, there's nothing there. Yeah. Like even, like even, even like a celebrity with 4 million followers, they'll like tweet something like my, Hey, my movie opens on Friday and there'll be like six likes. It's all, it's all fucking bullshit. Like the, don't ever look at my follower account or someone else's and think that there's something special. Um, there's, there's so, there's so many fake accounts. There's so many abandoned accounts. There are very few people actually on there like reacting to anyone else's shit. They're just on there to get their own shit off. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But like, I, I am not like that stature that people are like, wow, you have a million followers. It's really not a million followers. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good. I mean, fair. I'm sorry fair if that way. ruined, I'm sorry if that ruined the question. You want no, ask. I like, well, no, I've always, I've loved following you over oh, the years. I lost, and I lost, wait, I lost an AirPod. Hold all on. Good. <laughs> all right. Sorry. No. I was saying, like, I've loved following you over the years, and you mentioned, like, you only tweet, like, once a month, and you did kind of allude a little bit in the piece about social media, and maybe we can get into that, but why um, why did you cut back on Twitter, Josh? I just, I don't care anymore. I don't know. I don't care what other people think about everything under the sun. I don't think anyone should, I, I, don't, I don't think that I personally have anything that interesting to say from one day to the next that, like, needs to be put in the face of all these people. You know, I, I also understand there's this thing where like, you know, when you're, when you're an underdog and you're battling and you, you're not successful, you kind of have like more leeway for what you could say and do. And people are like, you know, they're, they're down with like your struggle. Right. And then like, God forbid, like you actually make it, you can't go home again. Like you can't go back. People don't want to, people don't want to fucking see you every second. Like once you've already become successful. Um, a lot, I think a lot of celebrities in the real world understand that in finance, we don't really have any celebrities. We don't have any famous people. So like we have people that are well known, but like in, there's no like famous financial advisor. And actually, if you asked Americans, like who is the most famous financial advisor, they would be like Warren Buffett, who is not a financial advisor or Jim Cramer, who is not a financial advisor, but like they don't. That, like that's that's the extent in our industry to which anyone has ever achieved any kind of like notoriety in in the public. So there's no real blueprint for this, but like I think you kind of learn the hard way. You stick around too long. You're in people's faces. You're like like your your existence almost is like irksome to people. And I not you. I mean like <laughs> colloquially. Yeah. Uh, 
what the royal you is out no but like if you're so i think what you want to do with these platforms is like not stay long enough and and continue to to put yourself in people's faces once you've already like made it or succeeded because uh nobody wants nobody nobody's happy for anyone else like is in is you know you're happy for your friends you're happy for your family and yes if there's an actress you like and she wins an oscar or there's a singer you like and they win a grammy yeah you're happy then it's like oh five grammys you know what fuck you right you're like oh you have another tv show oh great like like it gets to the point where it's like all right it's enough already um i think i think like even like even uh in the rap world like like Jay-Z is basically like running around an empty locker room, spraying himself with champagne at this point. Like he's gotten to a pinnacle that like nobody else has ever or probably will ever get to. Um, and it's like people st- will stop rooting for you. And I noticed he jumped on a Twitter spaces the other day and I forget what he was there to talk about, but they like went crazy on him. Like, like, like that he's a capitalist and all this stuff. It's like, wait, I thought he was – the most beloved, famous uh, musical artist of our time. This guy has like a Twitter uproar in his hand. That's, uh, that's weird. No wonder he stopped mm-hmm. tweeting. So you start to see like people that in in the real fame in the real world, they eventually disappear from these platforms. They don't stick around. And I think like a very, very, very minor miniature version of that is in finance. Like yeah. you look at certain people that just they're not engaging anymore because the downside is so much greater than the upside. I just, it makes me kind of wonder if that's maybe one of these other like undercurrents in society right now playing out. Um, You know, maybe it's more of that scarcity mindset too that you were, you're talking about earlier, like that you don't have this scarcity mindset, but maybe it kind of speaks to like, you know, if someone else wins or is successful, maybe someone thinks, oh, it's taking away from me or I I don't know, or they compare themselves. but it's it's not it's normal like it's it's natural if you're when you're coming up you look at people ahead of you as though they're in your way they've been there long enough and it's like when is it going to be my turn why is this girl still here why is this guy still here let me take that person down a peg and in doing so bring myself up a peg that's totally normal like that's that's look in the jungle. That's the young lion kills the older male lion so he can mate with the the pride. Like that, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying, like, why would any normal person want to um, repeatedly expose themselves to that dynamic? So, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of that going on where people are just like, all right, I don't need this shit anymore. And um, maybe I'm like a, an obvious example, but you know, it's, it's okay. Like it's time, you, by the way, nobody should be doing things they were doing 10 years ago, 10 years later. Like people should evolve. People should find new things, new hills to climb and, and new activities to pursue. Yeah. Well, that's a good point too. Um, just to stay. Uh, well, evol- I mean, well, I'm, I'm still writing a blog. I'm still writing a blog for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, but you probably have that direct relationship with the audience as well. Um, I love my audience. I love my fans. I don't. My fans are there, man. Like if I if I write a post, they're all getting it delivered to their inbox. Um, if if I do a podcast, if I do a video, it's tens of thousands of people are listening, watching. I I I live for my my fan base. I'm not like out there trying to convert people who don't like me to like, please like me. I, that's, I did, that's over now. That's an, I'm in a different phase. Yeah. Just, um, you know, being more comfortable too in like your own skin with your own ideas and your own voice. Um, you wrote in the piece, Josh, uh, social media has enabled the village idiots of every town and region to discover each other and band together in the millions. Society is actually regressing intellectually for the first time since the dark ages. We'll get into that at some other time. I know you're thinking about it. Can we get into it a bit more? No, we'll get into that some other time. Okay. Fair enough. Some other, some other time. I don't want to say a lot about that. Mm. I think it's, I think it's, it's self-explanatory. It's not worth it's not it's not it's not worth like riffing on it's it's just i think the nature a lot of social media has you know positives and there are some negatives and one of the negatives is there are a lot of people who have been able to find each other across geographic boundaries 
and uh, some of the externalities of that are not great. Got it. Well, I guess to kind of round out the conversation um, of everything you outlined in the piece, where do we go from here? <laughs> Dude, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew. If I if 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 I if I knew, uh, I probably wouldn't share it publicly. But I don't know. Um, so I think uh, I think a lot of when you read about financial market history, it's the same thing as regular history, right? There's always some spillover effect into the stock market and the bond market from things that happen in the wor real world. I think like five years from now, ten years from now. We'll look at the 2020 through 2022 period, and I think we'll conclude that like a lot of horrible things happened to people's loved ones, and a lot of people's lives were uh, altered in such a way that they were never the same. And I think you know I had teenagers or kids during the pandemic, and uh, I think there were some things that they went through that you know they'll never like they'll never be the same as they would have been had they been doing in-person school during that time and not have have had so many things taken away from them, so many rites of passage that, you know, kids are, are have been accustomed to for generations. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's like we really don't even know the, the effect. Um, but I also think that there will be some things that we look at and say, you know, that was a turning point for good or there there was a silver lining there. Like we, we probably jump-started – the vaccine industry. Um, and, and there are probably some things that will be created and devised and discovered as a result of all the money being thrown at, at, at this emergency that end up like saving more lives in the future. Like that's the history of America and American style capitalism. So I don't want to give people the impression that I'm negative about this whole experience, but uh, just try to think, you know, realistically about what what it is and and I don't know where we're going, but I hope uh, it's I hope things improve. I always hope things improve. I always expect them to. So I'm um, I'm definitely a long term optimist. Long term optimist. I think that's a great way uh, to conclude. Um, Josh, is there anywhere that we could send folks to learn more? Uh, I'm going to pass it to you just no, to plug the blogger. You imagine listening to an hour of of me and saying that's not enough. I need I need more. <laughs> I need more of this guy. Please, it's fine. If you if you read my if you read my blog, if you listen to my podcast, I love you for it. Thank you so much. And if if you you haven't yet, I'm really easy to find. And if you have and you're not into it, I totally get it. Uh, there are a lot of days where I don't want to hear my own thoughts either. So it's 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 cool. No matter what, we're we're all friends. We are all friends. Well, Josh Brown, the CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, I thank you so much for being so generous to with your time you. and Great ideas. Great to see you, Julia. Great to yeah, see you yeah. too. Great and good luck with the show. And and uh, you're you're amazing at what you do. And I can't imagine there is any uh, prominent person in America that wouldn't want to be interviewed by you. So I know this is gonna this is gonna be a hit for you. So congratulations. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate you. Take care. All right.